In these videos, we're going to talk about the paper Doom Safe User Level Access to Privileged CPU Features, which was published in 2012. So there are various features that have been added to x86 for virtualization. One is the extended page tables. As a reminder, what happens there is we have a guest virtual address that goes through a translation using the CR3 page table. That then gives us, gives us a host virtual address. And that host virtual address goes through a translation to provide a host physical address. And this is through the extended page table. So we have this two level translation with two sets of page tables. The hardware will go ahead and do this. On a TLB miss, it's then going to walk both page tables. The guest operating system just sees the CR3 and what they think of as the standard page tables. Those get converted to a host virtual address, and then that uses the extended page table to convert to a host physical address. A second set of changes has to do with I.O. So there are two different capabilities here. One is called sr iov And the idea here is if you've got a piece of hardware, an I.O. hardware, normally it has a single address that is provided in memory mapped I.O. that you can communicate with this I.O. hardware. What the SRIOV does is actually allows a device to expose multiple separate regions. So for instance, I might have this mapped to one region of memory and treat it as a virtual device one, treat it as a virtual device two, and as a virtual device three. So what I can do then is set up this memory mapped I.O. for these different ranges and or different areas of memory and assign those to different guest OS's. So I can have one guest OS that is accessing this I.O. hardware via this device, a second one here, and a third one here. And that way each of them can be directly communicating to the I.O. hardware through their own separate memory mapped I.O. spaces. If there was a single memory mapped I.O. space, then we wouldn't be able to do this because we would have multiple OS's all accessing the same memory space and overriding one another. In addition to this, we have something called I.O. MMU. So let's look at how a CPU does I.O. So we have a CPU with an MMU associated with it. And these talk to your memory bus. One thing that can happen is that a CPU can talk, let's say, to an I.O. device over an I.O. bus. And if it wants to, let's say, uh, read an Ethernet packet, it could go ahead and issue a request to the I.O. hardware, ask it for bytes of memory, and then it could read that memory and then write it on to the memory bus. So that's a possibility. But if there's a, a lot of data to be transferred, it'd be easier to take the CPU out of the loop. So what we do is we actually have the I.O. hardware attached to the memory bus. So the I.O. hardware is talking, can talk to the memory bus, and what that allows the CPU to do then is to issue a request to the I.O. hardware, but instead of reading byte by byte or word by word, instead it just says, hey, I.O. hardware, I'd like you to read this many bytes, you know, let's say a thousand bytes, into this memory address. So it will pass to the I.O. hardware a physical address. So it might have a request that says like, read packet in the physical address 1234 with some max length, let's say, or saying how, how large that buffer is. The I.O. hardware will then get that physical address, and then it can directly communicate with the memory bus, writing into address 1234, and then 1238, and then 123C, and so, so forth. So that all works great, and this is called DMA, direct memory access. The problem comes about when we have a guest OS running. So a guest OS is running, a virtual machine is running, and what it thinks of as physical addresses are actually not true physical addresses. They're hardware virtual addresses. So if we have a guest OS running up here that's using this translation here, and then below this we have a virtual machine monitor, 
so the virtual machine monitor is managing the EPT, then when the, if the guest OS is talking directly to this I.O. hardware and saying, I would like to read a packet into physical address, it doesn't have the physical address 1234. Uh, so let's say we have a mapping that is going, let's say, the hardware physical address is 1234, the hardware virtual address is uh, 8714, and the guest virtual address is uh, 1156. So the guest OS is going to say, well, I want to read into this virtual address. I know the I.O. can't handle virtual addresses. I'm going to go ahead and give it the what I think is the actual physical address. So it's going to say to the I.O. hardware, read packet into physical address 8714. The I.O. hardware then will happily go along and do that. And it's going to then try to write into real physical address 8714, which this uh, guest OS doesn't even have access to. So we'll be trashing someone else's memory. The solution then to allow the guest OS to maintain this fiction that it is actually dealing with physical addresses is we add an MMU here. And this is what's called IO MMU. So this IO MMU knows how to translate through the EP. So it will take the 8714 and feed it through the MMU. The MMU will do the conversion from 8714 to 1234, and that's what will show up in the MMU bus. This notice is a limited version of the MMU. The MMUs up here attached to the CPU not only do a translation through EPT, they also do a translation through CR3 because they're doing this two-level translation. So that is IO MMU. This is one of the three, so EPT is one, these two combinations for IO are two, and then the third is the final change that's made to the x86 architecture in order to allow hardware virtualization. So the final is called VTX. Let's look at how that works. The goal of the architectural changes to the x86 are to provide direct execution of privilege instructions. So the idea is rather than doing the traditional trap and emulate where every privilege instruction will do a trap and also where no instructions that leak the privilege state are available, that is those themselves are privileged, then we can do a standard trap and emulate. The way the x86 support for virtualization is done is separate from that. So what happens is we do something different. So we've got a virtual machine here. And the virtual machine has CPL levels. So we can have the CPL 0, CPL 3. And then what we do is we actually run this on top of a virtual machine monitor, which itself can have CPL 0 and CPL 3. And we are going to add a new kind of protection. So this new kind of protection is orthogonal to the CPL. And what we set up here is root mode and non-root mode. And just as with CPL, there are some instructions that are privileged and can only be run at a certain CPL level. Here, there are some instructions that are privileged and can only be executed when you're in root mode. So one of them, for instance, is the instruction that launches a virtual machine. So hashtag VM launch. We'll start up a virtual machine, and it uses a VM control structure. So this VM control structure, the VM control structure configures how this VM is going to be executing. We'll look at some of those options shortly. In addition, the VM control structure is used to save information. So as an example, let's say this VM goes ahead and does a clear interrupt. That is not going to trap, assuming we're in CPL0 mode of the VM. Instead, what it's going to do is turn off the bit in the E-flags that controls this. Well, those E-flags are part of this control structure. So this VM that's running in non-root mode can use CPL0 and CPL3. 
when a trap happens, for example, let's say a system call, that will go from the CPL3 to the CPL0. There's no trap and emulate. The hardware is just supporting this. There are some ways, of course, that you can get out of the VM back to the virtual machine monitor. So let's look at what some of those are. So one of them, so we have various ways to exit from the virtual machine to the virtual machine monitor. What are some of those ways? One way you can exit is through a trap, right? So any form of, let's say, configured traps, right? So configured from this VM control structure. So when the virtual machine monitor launches the VM, it basically says which traps are going to stay within the non-root mode and which are going to actually cause a VM exit. Well, we've seen one that we probably would want to be configured to stay in the non-root mode, and that is whatever the interrupt is for system calls. That's for, for JOS, it's what is it we use 48 I think so that we would uh, configure that interrupt to stay within here on the other hand something like a timer interrupt we would certainly want to go back to the virtual machine monitor why because the virtual machine monitor wants to make sure to be able to get control back from the virtual machine just like this virtual machine wants to get control back from a CPL3 process that's running and that will allow the virtual machine monitor to do whatever else it wants to do. Perhaps it is time slicing between additional virtual machines. That's certainly a possibility. The other way that we can exit is with a new instruction, which is VM call. So if this virtual machine is aware that it is running in non-root mode, it can issue a VM call to go back to the VMM directory. And it could provide information in registers that provides requests, let's say, for the VMM. That's a possibility. So we either have the VM call or we have configured traps. So some of the traps stay within the non-root mode. Some of them cause a VM exit out to the VMM. When we get out to the VMM, then what can occur is it can call back into the virtual machine. The first time, it called, used VM launch to actually uh, create this and second and subsequent times then it'll use so that's the way we get back into a running machine there are also let's look at page faults so what exactly would happen on a page fault that's slightly interesting so on a page fault it depends on where the fault occurs so if we've got a fault in the CR3 then it makes sense for that to be sent to the non root mode VM that's running so we could get a page fault here because we had an error in the CR3, right? Not present, for example, or we're trying to write something that's not writable. And that makes sense because then this guest OS can deal with it. It can update the page table if necessary and deal with it. On the other hand, if we have a page fault in the EPT, then that would cause a VM exit to go down to the VMM. For example, this might be because we've only, the VMM has only allocated certain physical pages for this VM. And we now have a page fault on one of them and need to go allocate another page. So that would be up to the VMM to do that. So this provides a mechanism for separate protection besides CPL0 to CPL3. It's really sort of orthogonal to it. We have a CPL03 here, CPL03, and then on top of this, we can actually have this root mode and not root mode. This was designed explicitly for running virtual machines. One thing you might say though is, what about virtualizing the VM launch, VM resume, VM exit, and so on? That can be somewhat difficult because in order to virtualize those, we actually don't have an easy way to do that. We'd have to really resort to trap and emulate uh, in order to carry that out. The combination of all three of these provides the hardware virtualization for x86. It's worth noting that there is actually Intel hardware virtualization and AMD hardware virtualization. And they are similar, but somewhat different. Uh, the reason for that, so Intel designed the x86 uh, architecture, right? And then they licensed 
to AMD. The reason they licensed to AMD is, as I remember, back in the day, IBM was, cre was uh, creating the IBM PC, and they didn't want a single source vendor for their CPUs. So Intel licensed the x86 to AMD, and then what has happened is right, we had common path, sort of an Intel and AMD on the architecture, but they split with regards to uh, any additional changes to the architecture after a certain point. And the reason for that is that AMD no longer had a license to new changes that were made to the architecture. So these splits in general have been fairly similar. These have to do with, for instance, vector instructions and again, some of these instructions as well. So it's something that can be handled with a bit of code as to the differences between those two.